<clears throat> so I'm going to jump right in um, with this third lecture on contemplation and creativity. Uh, we've spent some time uh, today thinking about different examples of moral agency under constraint. So the way in which people exercise power when they have limited freedom and choice. And we've utilized art and architecture as examples for that. So in this third lecture, I'm going to move into a more explicitly theological register. Of course, as is always the case, the theological claims that I share in this lecture have been present all day. Indeed, one of the reasons why I focus on moral agency under constraint is because I perceive the presence of God there. That is, I believe that God is always and everywhere doing a new thing. And in these contexts of constraint, when people create a space or open up a possibility, I perceive the movement of God. In this lecture, I invite you to think theologically about moral agency under constraint. I'll explain this central theological conviction that I carry into this work and how this material has enriched my understanding of God. I am not, however, offering a systematic theology to accompany this study of ethics. Uh, I am not a systematician. <laughs> you might have guessed, but <laughs> that's not my forte. Rather, I find myself thinking about the intersection between theology and moral agency through contemplation rather than systematics. So I invite you to think about examples of moral agency under constraint as resources for contemplative practice. This project has involved a very different kind of research for me. I was formed in traditional modes of scholarly practice. You sit with books, you read, you follow up footnotes, you read some more, you build your description based on texts, and you offer a text in response. More recently, I've been dipping into ethnographic methods of research, gathering data through interviews and participant observation, coding the data according to themes, and analyzing it. But this project, this research on moral agency under constraint is different. It involves reading, of course, and I do have themes that I'm tracing and dimensions that I'm analyzing. You've heard those throughout the day. But in addition to reading, I spend a lot of time simply looking and listening. More so than analysis, I find myself in a mode of reflection. I do less studying of the material and more sitting with it. This became apparent to me as examples of moral agency under constraint kept creeping into my morning meditation time. At first, I would put them to the side, thinking that my mind was drifting over to work rather than centering on prayer. And I would try to redirect my attention away from the research and writing tasks and back to my object of focus for the morning. Slowly, it dawned on me that no-contact connections, metalwork, and murals were not distracting me from prayer. They were my entry point. I found myself praying with them, praying through them. And this was a happy discovery for me. It enriched my prayer life to contemplate these examples in my morning meditation chair. But as I physically moved... From that chair to my desk, I felt like I needed to rearrange my relationship to the material again. I could contemplate in my prayer chair, but needed to study and analyze at my desk. My colleague Jennifer Ayers at Candler at Emory helped me to get clear about what was going on and offered me a different way to think about my relationship to this subject matter. In her lovely book called Inhabitants, Dr. Ayers writes about an immersive approach to learning, one that is marked by slow knowledge rather than fast knowledge. For this, she draws on the work of David Orr. Fast knowledge accumulates as much new information as possible and uses it to solve problems. It values what can be measured and what can be rapidly deployed. 
Slow knowledge does not assume that more information or rapid application solves problems. Slow knowledge seeks wisdom and assumes that the things we most need to know are already known. To quote Orr directly, fast knowledge deals with discrete things. Slow knowledge deals with context and patterns and connections. Fast knowledge arises from hierarchy and competition. Slow knowledge is freely shared with the community. Fast knowledge is mostly linear. Slow knowledge is complex and ecological. Fast knowledge is abstract and theoretical, engaging only a portion of the mind. Slow knowledge engages all of the senses and for the full range of our mental powers. Fast knowledge, he says, is always new. Slow knowledge is often very old. So Dr. Ayers builds on Orr's distinction to describe technical knowledge that holds something at an objective distance so that the knower can use the knowledge gained in some way. The knowledge is instrumental in nature, and the knower remains a sort of spectator or temporary resident. By contrast, Dr. Ayers calls us to a form of knowledge and learning that reflects inhabitants, right, inhabiting a space. She writes, being an inhabitant requires a kind of intentionality and relationality not required of the casual resident, a desire and capacity to live well in a place as an interdependent member of it. Inhabitants, she writes, is an art. Learning inhabitants summons human beings' deepest resources of moral wisdom, affection, and creativity. So Dr. Ayer's approach to ecological education has helped me to reframe my relationship to moral agency under constraint. These examples that I've been sharing with you today do not constitute a discrete object of study apart from my experience in the world. Rather, they offer insight into the world that I inhabit and the ways in which my fellow inhabitants are making a way there. They are not data points providing information. Rather, they represent a kind of wisdom that I'm trying to learn from. They are not just offering information about moral agency so that I can try to make an argument in my academic discipline. Rather, they are teaching me about life and about God. This is slow knowledge. It is, in fact, a form of contemplative practice. Contemplative practice is an intentional way of engaging the world. Attending to divine presence and cultivating connection, it is a form of prayer. And it is a practice of love. To approach my research in this mode has been liberating and life-giving for me because it has reconnected my spiritual life and my intellectual life. Now, maybe these two modes of existence have remained perfectly intertwined for you all along. If so, you are incredibly lucky. For many of us, there grows a separation between our life of prayer and our life of study, even though we know they are connected, especially in theological education. Now, I won't project my fragmented experience onto you, But I would be curious to know if this sounds familiar. Somewhere along the way, I learned to to relate differently to material, depending on whether I'm at my desk or in my prayer chair, in the classroom or in the chapel, in a conference or in church. At some point along the way, I learned that I cannot love something deeply and also reflect critically on it. And I learned that distinction, sorry, and that learned distinction has caused immeasurable confusion and unnecessary disconnection. Bringing contemplative practice to my desk (laughs) has been liberating and life-giving for me. I am learning to pay attention again. 
Mystics, contemplatives, and theologians from many traditions have long described attention as a form of prayer. I first read this from Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel 30 years ago. I learned it again from Simone Weil, who wrote that absolute attention is prayer. A teacher of mine, feminist eco-theologian Sally McFaig, loved this point. She would say in class something that she also wrote in one of her many books. They, she would say, does not say that prayer is absolute attention, but that absolute attention is prayer. (laughs) By paying attention, we are, in fact, praying. I love that. Now, McFaig was most focused on how to help Christians love nature, not in an instrumental way, but in and of itself. She spent her career pushing against the arrogant eye, meaning the way we look at something for what it can give us, how it can serve us, what it can do for us. Instead of the arrogant eye, McFaig encouraged Christians to look at nature with the loving eye, a look that appreciates a thing for itself, not for what it can do for me. When we pay attention with a loving eye, we are appreciating something for the thing it is. We are practicing slow knowledge. We are learning the art of inhabitants. Another theologian contemplative from whom I continue to learn is Wendy Farley. Like McFaig, Farley understands paying attention to be an act of love. In her book, which is titled Beguiled by Beauty, it's a great book, Uh, Farley focuses on the deep connection between contemplation and compassion. She writes, It's impossible to overemphasize that the core practice of a contemplative way of life is radical compassion. One's concentration may be impossibly wandering. One may not be able to sing three notes of a chant. A headstand may prove impossible. Securing 20 minutes twice a day for centering prayer may be no more realistic than growing wings and flying to the moon. These things, she says, are instruments that a contemplative might use, but they are not themselves what constitute a contemplative way of life. A contemplative way of life is motivated by a devotion to the welfare of others, she writes. Contemplative practice orients us toward others, not as something other or apart from God, but as a place where we know God more deeply. We see in the other the face of Christ. We see God in and through and beyond all things. So what does this mean for these reflections on moral agency under constraint in particular? Well, to begin, it means that we pay attention not only to the piece of art or activity or text, but we also pay attention to its effect on us. That is, we unlearn the posture of a detached observer and relearn how to pay attention to the relationship between our internal life and the world around us, including what we study. As Wendy Farley observes, the membrane between the internal and the external is incredibly thin. We not only process information in our brains, but we receive it in our bodies. And what's more, our bodies are not only receptors in the world, but also embedded in creation. We are, in every sense, part of the creation we observe. We learn as inhabitants. This is true not only for the natural world, but also for art and human action. I learned contemplative practice first through nature writing. Contemplating God's presence in nature is easy. It's natural. (laughs) Contemplating God through art, well, it depends on the art. Practicing a contemplative approach toward examples of moral agency under constraint doesn't mean that every encounter is a happy, deep, profound, or prayerful experience. Indeed, deep in meditative traditions, broadly, is the practice of awareness 
which extends to all dimensions of life, the things we like, the things we don't like. In the writings of Vietnamese Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh, we read that meditation is to be aware of what is going on in our bodies, in our feelings, in our minds, and in the world. Life is both dreadful and wonderful, and to practice meditation is to be in touch with both aspects. I find it helpful here to utilize a distinction between awareness and attention. It's a distinction that's important in contemplative practice. So uh, Andy Dreitzer, another uh, contemplative practitioner and teacher of mine and fortunately friend, um, explains it this way. Awareness refers to the ability to notice whatever is happening in any moment. Right? We practice awareness by noticing what is happening within us and around us, but we don't fixate on any one thing. Andy's example is that we notice, release, and repeat as though we're passing things in a car. Right? Sometimes the metaphor is you're sitting on the bank of a river and you're watching things go down the river, and you're just noticing them. Right? Notice, release, repeat. Attention is a companion discipline. Here we linger, we focus, we look, and we listen deeply. When our mind moves to something else, we bring it back. We return to the object of focus rather than releasing it. My contemplative practice with examples of moral agency under constraint is more like attention than awareness. I pay attention to the way that these examples speak to my soul. You know that feeling, right? When something you're reading or watching really grabs you, when the thing you're observing makes you come alive in some way, when that happens, when you feel that quickening in your heart or the catch in your throat, then it's best to lean in a little more. As you look at the world around you, where do you come alive? So let me share one example, another example, of an art form that has this effect on me. Again, I do not expect you to all feel the same way about this art that I do. In fact, I was recently at an exhibit of work by this very artist, wrapped in full attention, while a woman moved quickly from one piece to the next, shrugging. (laughs) (laughs) For me, this work that we're going to look at by Alexander Calder is a spiritual experience. So this is a mobile created by the sculptor Alexander Calder. It was hanging in the High Museum in Atlanta this summer as part of an exhibit that placed Calder in conversation with Picasso. It's a terrific exhibit, and it's still touring the country, so you can keep an eye out for it. Calder's mobiles give us an expression of creativity to contemplate. Additionally, his descriptions of the artistic process give us a helpful metaphor for moral agency under constraint. So let me begin with some information about Calder and his work, and then we'll think metaphorically and contemplatively about it. Alexander Calder grew up in Philadelphia in a family of artists. He was determined not to be an artist himself. And so he completed a degree in mechanical engineering in 1919. Four years later, he decided that he was an artist, after all, and he enrolled in the Art Students League in New York. His early work um, was two-dimensional wire sculpture that he and others called drawing in space. (laughs) This is his Medusa which is hanging at the high and casting a kind of shadow on the wall. One of his first projects was called Cirque Calder, a miniature circus crafted out of cork and string, wire, wood, yarn, and cloth. You can visit Calder's Circus at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York and now online. You can also watch a video of Calder moving the pieces around playing circus. It's great. I mean, you hear his voice in the background saying, oh, no, I'm from the center ring. It's awesome. (laughs) In the Calder Picasso exhibit, 
there's a ticket to the circus that Calder sent to Picasso. Serious artists at play. <laughs> In 1932, Calder spoke at the opening of an exhibit that announced him as the inventor of a new art form, the mobile. He asked, why must art be static? You look at an abstraction, sculptured or painted, an entirely exciting arrangement of planes, spheres, nuclei, entirely without meaning. It would be perfect but it is always still. The next step is sculpture in motion. The name Mobile was given to Calder's new art by Michel Duchamp, a French-American artist who had applied the term to his own moving objects for years. In French, Mobile carries a double meaning that Calder liked. As an adjective, it means movable. As a noun, it means motive. The mobile is both movable and something that spurs action. It is a structure designed to move and to motivate. Calder described his design process this way. When I cut out my metal plates, I have two things in mind. I want them to be more alive, and I think about balance, which explains the holes in the plates. The most important thing is that the mobile be able to catch the air. It has to be able to move. Now this quote electrified me when I read it for the first time about 15 years ago. We were living in Southern California and I was preparing a baccalaureate address after a very hard year. I wanted to say something to the students about how we have to work within institutions and still create spaces for freedom and flourishing. I had admired Calder's work for a while before that, but didn't know much about him until I came across an interview that included the catch the air quote. Calder's language and art gave me a way to talk about working within institutions without getting the wind knocked out of you. Since preaching on Calder's mobiles 15 years ago, I still end my required Christian ethics course with a talk about him every time I teach it. And here I am again, <laughs> thinking about Calder now as another metal worker, demonstrating moral agency, and as a resource for contemplating creativity. Creating structures that catch the air has become a life metaphor for me. It infuses the way I think about teaching, administrative tasks, political activism, church work, family life, research, and writing. Everything is about the ongoing work of creating and contributing to structures that can catch the air. Within constraints, how do we catch the air? How do we design structures that can catch the air and move? It's not surprising, of course, that a powerful life metaphor like this also becomes a way of thinking about my current research. Of course, moral agency under constraint is about working with structures to catch the air. <laughs> but I've suggested that Calder's mobiles are more than a metaphor for me. I've suggested that reflection on them is a form of contemplative practice. By this, I mean that mobiles and examples of moral agency under constraint broadly speak to me about God's ongoing creative presence in the world. Something that I believe to be true about God is made more real for me as I sit with this art and activity. I perceive in them the gracious and generative spirit of God. These materials teach me in slow ways what it means to inhabit structures without being stifled by them. What it means to find spaces of vitality within form, dynamism within constraint. So let's stay with Calder a little longer and think about his work now in relationship to some familiar biblical texts. In the first creation account in Genesis, we read that the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. Whether you understand this process to involve order from chaos, creation from nothing, 
or a poetic depiction of a pivotal moment in a process that has neither beginning nor end, you must find yourself thinking about creative creativity and structure, about vitality and form, or at least you better after today. <laughs> the words capture creativity, vitality, the extravagant gesture, and mystery. And the same words convey a careful rhythm, a structure, a form. Light is separated from darkness. The firmaments separate water from water. The earth brings forth vegetation and fruit, each according to its kind. Seasons, days, years are established. Evening and morning, evening and morning. There is creativity and there is structure. Now the structures and forms that give shape to our life and work can also stifle us deny personhood and personal authority, limit opportunities for growth and expression, quash creativity, silence voices, reject knowledge, and in short, impinge on vitality in all kinds of ways. What's more, the Genesis account often functions to reinforce these oppressive structures. The structuring, the forming of the universe, is used to order relationships and more often than not, to order them in hierarchical and oppressive ways, and then to insist that such hierarchical arrangements are built into the structure of the universe purposefully by God. We function within structures and within forms that threaten our creativity and impinge on vitality in various ways. The colloquialisms that we use in English to describe these experiences are telling. We say, I felt stifled. I had the wind taken out of my sails. I felt utterly deflated. Right? Structures can squeeze the life out of you if you're not careful. But the answer is not to quit structures, not to leave them. I believe wholeheartedly that structures, forms, institutions are not only necessary, but are the very context of our calling. We are called to minister to someone within some form that has some governing body and some structural process. We are called to teach in an institution that has procedures for admission, advancement, and assessment. We're called to be responsible citizens in cities and states that have structures regulating civic life. We're called to be faithful to the sacred commitments that form partnerships and family. These forms and structures are not only a necessary part of being embodied and embedded, they are the very context of our calling. But what is absolutely crucial to our survival is to know that this context of all these structures is not stagnant. It's not fixed. The Spirit of God is still moving across the waters. This is a continuous creation, and our lives unfold in covenant. So remember these words from Isaiah. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take your hand and I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. God is always and everywhere doing a new thing, within creation and within covenant. God generates possibility within the context of an enduring relationship. God is the one who set the stars in the firmaments and holds our hand, the one who spreads out the earth and all that springs from it and calls us into community. We can't quit structures 
in a personal pursuit of freedom. We must build into the structures we inhabit some mechanisms for constructive change. Within institutions and within community, we craft mechanisms that can catch the air and inspire transformation. So again, what does all this mean for our understanding of moral agency under constraint? Well, I think it means that we need to design in our lives and in our institutions, in every context of constraint, mechanisms that can catch the air, the moving, transforming, possibility-creating spirit of God. We need to adopt contemplative practices that help us to perceive this generative spirit in every place and time. God is always and everywhere doing a new thing. Seeing the world through the lens of moral agency under constraint has helped me attend to this. Attention to moral agency under constraint is prayer. Studying moral agency under constraint has also given me an excuse or a reason to contemplate these mechanisms that can catch the ear. For all of their variety, all of the examples that I've shared today share this feature. When we contemplate them, we become aware of the way that they are designed to catch the air, to move, to motivate. Calder's artistic process provides a metaphor for moral agency under constraint and a metaphor for the movement of God. When I look at a piece of art that inspires transformation, or when I contemplate an activity that forges connections in the midst of isolation, what I see is God's creative presence in the world generating possibilities. If I approach these examples of moral agency under constraint contemplatively, then I also see them as a resource for reflecting on the divine. In each of these examples, I perceive the movement of a God who is always and everywhere doing a new thing. Because I believe that God is present in history, doing a new thing, opening up spaces, extending possibilities, then I understand this work of exercising moral agency under constraint to be holy work. Now, I want to be clear about what I'm saying. I'm not projecting my, th- my theology onto the artists and other agents that I've been talking about today. I'm not making a claim about how they understand their work theologically. I'm saying, as I contemplate their work in the world, I perceive the movement of God doing a new thing, opening up possibilities. Constraints of all kinds persist, but within constraints, the artist creates possibilities. They put a wedge in the door. Now, I realize this is a pretty modest take on social change. Indeed, it risks a form of quietism or passivity or even acceptance of the status quo, the normalizing of constraint that we talked about this afternoon. Given the needs we have as a society and the intransigent nature of so many social, political, and economic problems, don't we need to aspire to more than a wedge? Don't we need more than a mechanism that catches the ear? Where's the prophetic proclamation? Where's the table-flipping energy for social change? Well, in my view, it's here. It's here embedded in the conviction that God is always and everywhere doing a new thing. The prophetic proclamation is present in the assertion that the God of continuous creation generates possibilities. In the presence and ministry of Jesus, we learn that not even death has the last word, that faith yields revolution, and that people with a commitment to love and justice can get a toehold in history and upend the whole thing. Mobiles are a metaphor not because they spin passively above us, but because they move and they motivate. They are a metaphor for the movement of God across the waters, creating the possibilities for the liberation of people within a flourishing planet. Contemplative Contemplating moral agency under constraint does not promise triumph or happy endings 
or the crumbling of all oppressive structures, at least in our lifetimes. But it does help us attend to possibility, and this is no small thing. Given the dire nature of so many problems facing us, glimpsing possibility is utterly magnificent. (laughs) Contemplating creativity draws our attention to the mechanisms created by human beings to catch and move with the Spirit of God and invites us to create our own mechanisms as well. You don't need to be a mechanical engineer or an artist to make them. You might just need some soap and a plastic circle, image that's probably familiar to you. Catching the air. You might need a paper and a pen, a journalistic habit, right? And a quiet prayer chair, a sitting posture and a deep breath. The capacity to listen with an open mind and an open heart. These are all mechanisms for catching the air and moving with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is still moving across the waters. Even within structures that limit freedom and choice, God is present, creating possibilities. Now, at some point in these conversations about agency, the notion of effectiveness has likely crossed your mind. It came up in some of the conversations this afternoon, I think. If we are talking about people's capacity or ability or power to act, then we must at some point also wonder whether they are actually able to affect change. Do these forms of moral agency make a difference? Can, they, can we assess their impact? Are they actually transformative in any measurable way? Well, of course, it depends what you mean by measurable. Like Emmanuel, We have a Doctor of Ministry program at Candler, and the course I teach for that degree lands at the end of the sequence when students are completing their DMIN project. And so as a class, we spend a good deal of time thinking about how to assess the changes that their projects aspired to in their various contexts of ministry. Did that initiative strengthen community? We ask. Did it increase involvement from young people in your church? Did it deepen congregants' sense of vocation or commitment to outreach? Did your project grow the kingdom of God? (laughs) And as we wrestle with these important questions and language of assessment, we often come back to a quote attributed to Albert Einstein, that what counts most can't be counted. To my mind, one of the most exciting developments in the world of assessment, which is not a very exciting place, that might be kind of a low bar, but one of the most exciting developments in the world of assessment has been the language of generativity. Now, you've likely encountered generativity as a concept in pastoral care and counseling or in psychology and moral development. In that context, Eric Erickson used the term to denote developmental, a developmental stage marked by a concern for establishing and guiding the next generation. Today, in the context of assessment, generativity is used to consider the ongoing and broader impact of a project. What did it spawn, is the question. What did it lead to? What further projects or insights or relationships or ideas did it generate? In other words, generativity measures the effectiveness of something according to its fruitfulness. What else did it yield? What new things started from that one thing? This is quite different from measuring change according to what we bring to completion. We ask, what did you begin rather than what did you finish? What possibilities did you initiate, rather than how many goals did you accomplish? This does not need to be an either-or situation, of course. We could ask both, what did you accomplish and what did you initiate? So as I close these lectures on moral agency under constraint, I want to invite you to think about generativity. In context of constraints, where do you see possibility? 
Where do you contribute to opening a space? How do you create and maintain relationship across distance? How do you enter into spaces that seem utterly fixed and unmovable and plant a wedge for something new? How do you craft mechanisms to catch the air and respond to the movement of God? In your ministry, study, and outreach, where do you feel most alive? It may be hard to measure your answers, but they still count. Indeed, within the constraints of institutional life, where we all spend a lot of time in various forms of assessment, thinking in terms of generativity might be the act of moral agency that we all need. So in conclusion, I just want to say that I've really enjoyed being with you all today. I've appreciated your attention, your thoughtful questions, and the meaningful conversation in this room and in the hallways. I appreciate your kindness and your hospitality to me. And I wanted to, if it's okay, offer a blessing in closing. And then I'll step aside and we'll see if there are questions and things. So please receive this blessing. As you move through this semester together, May God's spirit bring vitality to your work. As you minister to the world in need, may God's breath enliven you and empower you. As you assume responsibilities within institutions, may God's creative presence transform you. In all that you do, may God's love enable you to craft relationships and contribute to structures that can catch the air. For our time together, the places that shape us, the freedom to question, the love of learning, the energy to keep trying, the people who care for us, and the people we love, we give thanks. And let the people say, Amen. Amen.